What's up everybody, welcome to another video and I hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles because it is Friday and we're back with another proof. We're gonna prove another one of the limit laws. This time we're gonna show that the limit of a sum is equal to the sum of the limits. Pretty cool, right? So here's your chance to pause the video, pull out a piece of paper, pull out a pencil, put your thinking cap on tight, flex those brain muscles, see if you can prove this on your own. Spend some time thinking about it. If you get stuck, press play, you can see what I do. Uh, but that's really how we get better at proofs, is we really try to construct our own understanding of these and really just dive into it and try on our own. So I highly encourage that. Also, I like these proofs because they're very beginner friendly. All you really need to know is the delta epsilon definition of a limit, and you should be able to prove this. So if you're not familiar with that, I have a decent video on it. Click right up there. And if you wanna see the last limit law I proved, I'll put that link right up there as well. Let's go ahead and get into it. How do we start? Well, let's read what we're trying to show here. Let's see, let f and g be functions such that the limit of f of x exists and equals l, and the limit of g of x as x approaches a exists and equals m. Okay, so both these limits exist. We're gonna prove that the limit of the sum, right? I'm sorry, let's see, yeah, the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits, that's right. So, proof, how do we start? Well, we gotta think back to what is our definition of a limit. What does it mean for this thing to exist and equals l? Well, that means for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that if zero is less than, et cetera, et cetera, right? You should know the definition. So what do I need to do? Well, I need to be any epsilon greater than zero. So that's why we just let epsilon be an arbitrary number greater than zero. Let epsilon be greater than zero. That's how we start pretty much any delta epsilon proof we start this way. And a lot of proofs that involve limits, you know, we start this way because of our definition for any epsilon greater than zero. So now what are we gonna do? Well, there's a formula at least that I use for, you know, proofs that have to do with limits and especially these delta epsilon proofs and that's that I let epsilon be greater than zero, then I write out the definitions of all the stuff I'm allowed to assume, right? Of all the stuff I've been given, write out those definitions and then see if I can sort of fill in the gaps and you'll see what I mean. So I'm gonna write out the definitions. If there's an epsilon greater than zero, then that means there exists a delta That means there exists a delta such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Basically, there, there, for each epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta such that if x is within delta distance of a, that guarantees that f of x is within epsilon distance of l, right? So I can get as close to l as I want by just requiring my x to be closer to a. That's what it means kind of intuitively, again, check out that video if you need to gain some intuition around that. So where are we at? I wrote out the definition for what it means for this limit of f of x as x approaches a to equal l. Now let's write out the other piece of information we have. Real quick, pause. Where's the mistake? Do you see the mistake I'm making? I think I'm assuming something that I shouldn't be assuming. Think about it for a second. Here's a delta greater than zero. Here's a delta greater than zero. Can I assume that they're the same delta? No, I can't, right? For every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta. That, there's a delta that corresponds to this function f, and there's also one for g. I can't assume they're the same thing. They're probably not the same thing. They could be, but I definitely can't assume it. So I need this to be delta one, right? That's the delta that works for f of x, delta one. And I need this to be delta two, okay? There also exists a delta two greater than zero, such that if do my epsilons need to be different? No, it's any arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. That doesn't matter. I don't need epsilon one, epsilon two, but the deltas I definitely do. Delta one, delta two. So now I've wrote out the definitions for the stuff I'm assuming, the stuff I've been kind of given, right? And now what I like to do is skip ahead. Let's write out what we're trying to show, what we're trying to end up with and work backwards, meet in the middle, and then erase and act as if it was obvious all along because that's what textbooks tend to do with these kind of proofs, right? When in reality, delta epsilon proofs are usually done in reverse and then they are unreversed when they're written out formally, right? Uh, so let's see, what am I trying to show? I'm trying to show that this limit exists and equals L plus M. So I'm trying to show that there exists I'm sorry, that for every epsilon greater than zero, I've already got that. I'm trying to show there exists a delta that works for this, such that if zero is less than absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, it guarantees that what? I'm trying to end up with absolute value of f of x plus g of x. 
what? Uh, minus L plus M. The negative will distribute, right? Minus L minus M. I'm trying to show that this whole thing is less than epsilon. That's what I want to show. So obviously I can't just jump to that, but this is uh, what really works for me is writing out what I'm trying to show and then sort of working backwards. And here I'm about to use something that's really, really useful in real analysis. It comes up over and over and over again. Really useful tool. And that is called the triangle inequality. Really important to understand. So what I can do here is I can separate this using the triangle inequality. I can say, well, this is less than or equal to the absolute value of f of x minus l plus the absolute value of g of x minus m. Right? And both the sum of both of these, right? We know each of these are less than epsilon. So this is less than epsilon plus epsilon. That's two epsilon. So that means that this whole thing is less than two epsilon, but I want this to be just epsilon, not two epsilon, right? Hopefully y'all can see down here. I'm kind of up against the wall. I want this to be just epsilon. So what can I do? Well, I can write this as epsilon, but what do I need to do? I need this to be epsilon over two and this as well. It's a clever little trick, right? And that's the reason I didn't immediately write out epsilon over two. I remember proving this and I knew it was gonna end up being that. But these, in reality, are how these proofs are done. I don't know immediately it's going to be epsilon over 2. I need this scratch work to tell me how to adjust my epsilon accordingly. And this is why textbooks, again, are so hard to understand because they'll just throw epsilon over 2. They'll just throw that out there like it's supposed to be obvious. It's not. They've done this scratch work ahead of time. They've erased it, and they haven't put it in the textbook, right? So this is a scratch work that shows the epsilon over 2s. So really, I'm almost done. The only thing I need to do is worry about my delta, right? Because what am I trying to show? I'm trying to show that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus a is less than that delta, then this is all true. But under what conditions do I know that this is true, that this whole thing is less than epsilon? Well, this has to be true. And where's the other one? That's delta one and delta two, this has to be true, right? So x has to be within delta one distance of a, and x has to be within delta two distance of a, right? Both of these have to be satisfied in order for me to arrive at this conclusion and say it's true. So what do I do? I pick the minimum, Pfft, mind blown, right? Pick delta equals the minimum of delta one, delta 2. So what does this do? That guarantees that both of these are satisfied, right, with this delta. So then I can fill in the gaps here. Then if there we go, I filled in the gaps. Then if this is satisfied, right, or new delta with the minimum, then surely all of this is true. And this is bi triangle inequality. You usually don't even have to write bi triangle inequality because it's so commonly used. People just automatically know why you can do this here, right? This is less than epsilon over two. This is less than epsilon over two. The sum of those epsilon over two plus epsilon over two, that gives us this less than epsilon. And there we go, proof complete. There's my happy little box. And that's it. Let me know what y'all think of this proof. Hope y'all enjoyed this video. Last thing, before I go, I'd like to leave an exercise for the viewer. Try this, show that the limit of the difference equals the difference of the limits. It's almost identical to what I just did, literally almost identical. So try this on your own. It's a good exercise. Uh, you can really put your delta epsilon skills to the test. And next week, we'll do another proof. Hope you all enjoyed this. Comment below, like, subscribe, do all that stuff. But most importantly, keep flexing those brain muscles. See y'all later.